What's good, Self-Direct Investors? I hope you're all doing great, and welcome back to the final episode of Reality Check Cannabis in 2020. We have arrived at the series finale. I was originally planning to do 10 episodes, however, the material fit perfectly into 8, so make sure you go back and watch any of the old episodes for context if you've missed any. If you've already subscribed to the channel, thank you so much for doing so, as it helps the channel out a lot, and if you haven't subscribed, please do so to make sure that you don't miss any new content, as I plan to scale up this channel after a short break. That being said, if you enjoy this video, please hit a thumbs up button, and without further ado, let's dive into the series finale, The Global Potential of Cannabis and Hemp. We start with an eerily accurate prediction from the book The Emperor Wears No Clothes, originally published in 1985 by cannabis activist Jack Herer, who died in 2010. He writes, In 2020, U.S. petroleum resources will have dwindled to 20% of their original size, giving the U.S. six options. Do any of these sound familiar to you? More coal and pollution? Do nuclear properly or risk another Chernobyl? Convert forests into fuel? Or wage wars in the Middle East for oil? Sadly, since the year 2000, they've all been done. The US has maxed out its options. The last two rational and sustainable choices are clean energy systems and energy farms for biomass, which they must shift to as soon as possible. Now you might be wondering, what if there was a crop we could mass harvest for clean, renewable energy with just land, water, and sunlight? You guessed it, America can harvest, cultivate, and convert hemp into clean energy to cover all of their needs on just 6% of total US acreage. Imagine a global effort? In fact, it's the only way to phase out fossil fuels sooner than later. Any country can do this to save themselves long-term, and every country should do this to become more self-sufficient. In America, though, the show's become too visibly rigged, and greed has tainted capitalism. Thankfully, the tech nerds have leveled the playing field with the internet so anyone can educate themselves, truly giving power back to the people. What a time to be alive. To quote the great Carl Sagan, the world's struggle for money is really about energy, which allows us to produce goods, shelter, transportation, and entertainment. It is this struggle that often erupts into war. Remove the cause, the conflicts may never occur. Although we've been misled for decades, despite scientists' warnings, clean energy is on the rise as operational costs decline, and we can now envision the problems our kids and grandkids will face. This is why hemp for biomass needs real awareness, now. Sadly, it's been completely overlooked because of the legal status, despite being the answer to our clean energy needs. So part one of this episode will cover cannabis, part two will cover hemp. Let's jump in. Here's to a new perspective and an ode to Bob Marley, a force of peace and love that popularized reggae music and cannabis. Jamaica's unique past is worth sharing. Put yourself in the 1700s. First a colony of Spain, then England, Jamaicans weren't free, and main exports were sugar, cocoa, and dye, not cannabis. At some point though, cannabis did arrive on the island. The British sent a Russian expert to cultivate, but he failed until 1840 when contracted workers from British-controlled India at the time arrived, recognized the plant as cannabis indica, similar to what they had back home, and went to work. The laborers came to replace the newly freed population and taught them how to cultivate the plant. How beautiful to appreciate humans working together teaching other humans without prejudice laws or fear getting in the way. A century later, since cannabis was used daily on the island by most, the Center for Studies of Narcotic and Drug Abuse saw a unique opportunity. As a branch of the U.S. National Institute of Mental Health, they wanted to assess how chronic users were affected by cannabis over time, so they sponsored a study in 1970. Results were published in 1975 titled Ganja in Jamaica, which you can Google. Are you ready? By the way, one of the researchers, Vera Rubin, is the astronomer that discovered dark matter, so she's a pretty credible source to consider. They found cannabis use was the reason for substantially lower levels of alcoholism than anywhere else in Caribbean society. Hmm, really now? They also found cannabis did not cause any measurable chromosomal or brain damage and was deemed not psychologically dangerous. Plus, there was zero evidence of any causal relationship between cannabis use and mental deterioration, insanity, crime, violence, or poverty. Yet, like other studies before, it was ignored by the US government since it didn't fit their narrative. And because of that, cannabis is still illegal in Jamaica today, despite being a norm. It's been over a hundred years since the 1894 Raj Commission, the Siler Commission, the LaGuardia Commission, Nixon's Schaefer Commission, Canada's Ladane Commission, Ganja in Jamaica, and the California Research Advisory Commission, all saying the same thing. To this day, there is no evidence to back up any false US government claims about cannabis. In fact, according to America's lung expert, Dr. Donald Tashkin of UCLA in 1997, 
Tens of millions smoke cannabis regularly in the U.S., yet cannabis has never caused one single known case of lung cancer. Think about that. Not one case of cancer attributed to cannabis use or cannabis smoke. Tashkin describes cannabis as a complex, highly evolved plant with 400 compounds in its smoke, 60 presently known to have therapeutic value. Although counterintuitive when we think of smoking because cigarettes do kill us, this is why we need less ignorance and more research. Obviously, I'm no doctor, but looking at the facts and history, there is a lot more evidence supporting cannabis as a major pro for humans than a con whatsoever. In fact, cannabis made up half of all medicines sold in the 1800s and was in the US and European pharmacopoeias as the primary medicine for over 100 separate illnesses and diseases until removed by forced idiocy. Funny how the active ingredient THC was only discovered in 1964, which means the records and intuition of our ancestors were far more accurate than the current US government. Dr. Raphael Mechelam, the Israeli scientist who discovered THC, said in 1976 if cannabis were legal, it would replace 10 to 20% of all prescription medicine like that. Instead, Big Pharma became the national drug dealer and 2018 saw 67,000 opioid overdoses alone. Imagine the numbers of lives saved if we listen to facts. At this point, I certainly trust the collective wisdom of humanity and my own lived experience far more than the US government on this topic because it's absolute nonsense. Studies at UCLA, Harvard, plus Ganja in Jamaica confirm the therapeutic benefits of cannabis for dealing with many common conditions. While Mechelum, still alive today, in 1997 stated cannabis is the world's best overall medicine. And when you realize the families against organizations are funded by the same private interests to misinform parents, spread fear, and keep the status quo alive, it's absolutely sickening. How did Bob Marley, that soothing voice reminding you that every little thing is gonna be all right, how did he view the plant? He said in 1975, when you smoke herb, herb reveals yourself to you. Sounds like a good ego check everyone could use once in a while. He went on to say, all the wickedness you do, the herb reveals itself to you. You're conscious, show up yourself clear, because herb makes you meditate. It's only a natural thing, and it grow like a tree. In context to his Rastafarian views, it's not a drug, but a divine substance. Now, I'm not asking anyone to take up smoking, but consider his point of view. It may help you see a new perspective, so future sober you can take action to fix any current or past problems. Sounds a lot more like a tool than a threat. Perhaps we can learn something from Bob. To lead with love, not fear, judge less, and act more. So just to refresh, cannabis is the female plant high in THC for medicinal purposes, while hemp is the male plant high in CBD for industrial purposes. I can't believe I'd never Googled this until now, but the numbers speak for themselves. US crime rates related to alcohol, 40% of all violent crimes today. While six in 10 convicted inmates said they'd been drinking regularly before their offense, which means having an alternative available equals less crime, and the data from Colorado and Washington supports this. A safer, healthier, more empathetic world is one without prohibition. To recap, a Biden win or Democratic Senate paves the way for the MORE Act, a bill sponsored by Kamala Harris that would remove cannabis from the list of scheduled substances and eliminate criminal penalties past and present. This is huge because you don't want cannabis going into any other schedule, which still gives the government control. You want it completely removed so no one controls it. Combine that with the UN vote to reschedule cannabis in December. If the right dominoes fall, medicinal cannabis may go global, waking these untapped markets a lot sooner than later. Don't believe we're at a pivotal turning point in America? Take it from the Founding Fathers. In the 1700s, Thomas Jefferson and Dr. Benjamin Rush feared the federal government might attempt to control medicine allowing healing to one class of men while denying the privilege to others. Now, Big Pharma does exactly that, and the war on drugs fuels the division between classes. Take it from Honest Abe, prohibition is an attempt to control by legislation, making a crime out of things that are not crimes. A prohibition law strikes a blow at the very principles upon which our government was founded. Abe wouldn't even be mad at this point, he'd be straight disappointed. And let's see how good old American leadership compares to recent scapegoats. According to author Rowan Robinson, surviving correspondence indicates George Washington preferred to smoke hemp rather than drink alcohol, while James Madison admitted smoking cannabis inspired him to found a new nation on democratic principles. Andrew Jackson, Zachary Taylor, Franklin Pierce served as military commanders and smoked with their soldiers, unlike Trump, who avoided the military draft in five different ways. So how about recent leadership? Well, it was disclosed in 1979, the family that brought you George H. W. and George W. were large shareholders in Eli Lilly and Pfizer. 
which means the Bush family has profited significantly, not just from keeping cannabis illegal, but off of the opioid epidemic as well. Now, the sleeping giant that is the global legal cannabis market is estimated to be worth $100 billion by 2024. With the EU estimating total medical and recreational markets to hit 40 billion USD by 2024, I find it quite funny how safe the market size estimates are for Asia, that recreational prediction is China's population alone. Better to set the bar really low and blow right past it. While the Geneva Business News estimates the total size of the global cannabis markets, legal and illegal, to be worth $340 billion, with Asia leading the pack at $132.9 billion. And what have we found to be the leading driver of crime? Black markets created by prohibition. Note the progress made. Despite global prohibition, it's estimated over 260 million people consume cannabis annually. Now, more than 50 countries have legalized some form of medical cannabis, and six countries have legalized for recreational purposes. Great job so far, humanity. Keep going. And rapid expansion of current markets is a result of increased acceptance and re-acknowledgement of cannabis's therapeutic potential. People try it and realize it works. New Frontier data reported 95% of medical patients expressed that using cannabis improved their conditions, while 66% experienced significant improvements. Because the plant is that good at what it does, it can't be denied any longer, especially when an estimated 1.2 billion people worldwide have medical conditions cannabis can help. For this reason, I'm extremely proud to be Canadian, as we have had the courage to lead this resurgence. Opportunity, at the moment, lies in the recreational markets in Canada and the recreational and medical markets in the U.S. So if you invest in Canada, what sort of growth can you expect in the coming years? Now, for more info on Canada specifically, I recommend you check out Episode 7, but Canada's last reported total month of revenue was July 2020, and they brought in $231 million, up 15% from June. Sales in Ontario, the province with the most population, rose from 48 million in June to 60 million in July, after 23 stores were opened, while every single province grew sales from May to June and June to July. I was really hoping the August numbers would be out in time to include, but they will be released in the coming weeks, so I will cover the August numbers in a separate video on my channel going forward. But also, as mentioned in Episode 7, Canada's dismal 2019 performance of 1.2 billion total revenue for cannabis sales was due to the fact Ontario opened 25 stores for 14.5 million people. The good news that we know is Ontario is now opening 40 stores a month, so that's 673 stores by the end of 2021, not even halfway to the 1,500 stores needed for 15 million people. Do you see the correlation here? More stores over time equals more sales over time. And CannabisBenchmarks.com shows the growth percentage in all provinces from June to July when total Canadian sales rose by 15%. Those brick and mortar stores help a lot, eh? So if total Canadian recreational sales grew by 8% from May to June after Ontario opened 18 new stores in April, and total Canadian recreational sales grew by 15% from June to July after Ontario opened 26 new stores in May, is it fair to expect more sales growth with 40 more stores a month? I think so. Let's use a safe 10% benchmark between 8 and 15 to project total Canadian sales for 2020 because if Ontario sales rose from 48 million to 60 million in a single month, that's extra revenue going to the top licensed producers from Ontario alone. And so if Canada's total monthly sales continue to grow by 10% into December, Canada will finish the 2020 fiscal year with roughly $2.8 billion in revenue, a 133% increase from 2019. Remember though, 40 stores a month doesn't stop in 2021 either, and more stores means easier access to legal cannabis, taking more money and market share out of the black market. I believe we will see massive increases into 2022, thanks to a once-in-a-lifetime new industry, plus expansion, more stores, and a severely undersupplied market, Ontario. If you do choose to invest, make sure to keep track of the real data to compare to Canadian sales growth over time. I'll put a link for the Canadian sales data in the description so that you can find it for future reference. And until the world opens up, these are the top licensed producers fighting for market share in Canada. You may be wondering, if combined market capitalizations equal 13 billion US dollars, and the Canadian market right now is on pace for 2.8 billion in 2020, how do these market caps make sense? They don't. Welcome to the stock market. To quote Ben Graham, In the short run, the market is a voting machine, but in the long run, it is a weighing machine. In time, the companies that execute and perform do rise to the top. Plus, Canada's population is projected to hit 41 million by 2030, so although that's pretty slow growth, this once-in-a-lifetime shift in perspective makes me very bullish. Plus, we're not alone, as U.S. multi-state operators can't be ignored any longer. What kind of growth can you expect out of the U.S.? 
a lot more because there's a lot more people. AmericanCannabis.org estimates the total sales of legal cannabis, medical, and recreational in the U.S. would be $14.5 billion in 2020 and could reach $23 billion by 2025. As of October 2020, 68% of Americans live in a state with access to medical cannabis, while 28% of Americans live in a state with access to recreational cannabis, while 68% of Americans are in favor of legalization, the most ever. Then I found these predictions from MJ Biz Daily, blowing the old ones out of the water. Published June 2020, they say U.S. retail sales are on pace to rise 40% in 2020 alone, up to $30 billion by 2024. Then, September 23rd, Global Newswire reported an updated publication from BDSA, a leader in comprehensive cannabis market intelligence and consumer research. They confirmed that despite the global RONA situation, global cannabis sales in 2020 will grow 38% from $14.5 billion in 2019 to $19.7 billion, a majority of that being in the U.S. These predictions forecast cannabis sales at $47 billion in 2025, with a compounded annual growth rate of 22% even without federal legalization. Keep that in mind. Which means an investment in a top U.S. multi-state operator is expected to return 22% annually into 2025, reiterating the best time to buy and hold is now. Bullsbreakfast.com put together a list of dispensaries in operation for each multi-state operator so far as the companies navigate the Wild West terrain to connect Americans with better alternative medicine. And guess what? The same correlation between number of stores and sales numbers will apply to the U.S. once cannabis is descheduled and expansion takes place. Once in a lifetime. Cureleaf holds 94 dispensaries, Trueleaf is second with 60, followed by Columbia Care at 49. Some companies have gotten a head start. Harvest rounds off the bottom at 35, and these are the rest that follow. The longer federal legalization takes, the more time for companies to perfect operations, supply the demand, and collect a war chest of cash to expand when cannabis is finally descheduled. Here's that same number of operational dispensaries from a different perspective. States are listed across the top, with total dispensaries on the bottom. Florida currently has the most dispensaries with 246, then Pennsylvania with 43, so there's plenty of room for growth. Company websites are great places to find up-to-date information, as is this great resource, NewCannabisVentures.com. Below Scott's miracle Grow and GW Pharma are the top five U.S. multi-state operators mentioned in Episode 3, with the top three already surpassing $100 million in quarterly sales. All of these companies release earnings in November, so although this is the final episode of Reality Check, I will cover the updated financials and do an updated overview in other videos. So where do we stand today? If you want future global exposure, your best bet is a free us, since federal legalization in Canada allows global exports. And if you want to capitalize on U.S. growth in the coming years, even without legalization, just watch those top U.S. multi-state operators. <coughs> Truly. <coughs> Find a few companies you're interested in, add them to your watch list, pay attention, figure out a market cap that you think is fair value, and when the dip comes, you pull that trigger, stay patient, and hold long. Your future self will thank you. This week in cannabis, a few updates to look at that can be summarized as the evil, the pathetic, and the icing on the cake. New FBI data confirms the U.S. criminal justice system is evil. More people were arrested for cannabis last year than violent crimes. How can any sane human support this? In 2019, 545,000 Americans were arrested for cannabis. Of those 545 arrests, 92% were for simple possession, while 495,000 Americans were arrested for violent crime. That's 500,000 more American sons and daughters labeled criminals in 2019 alone, thanks to decades of fearful parents wanting tougher laws on something that was never the problem in the first place. The pathetic goes beyond comprehension. Your current president is playing hard to get with American lives, holding stimulus hostage to acquire more votes. When I was a kid, I wondered why I wasn't born in America. Today, I understand. While the icing on the cake for Canadian LPs, Afria released Q1 2020 earnings on October 15th. All three top players in Canada have reported their latest recreational numbers. Last quarter, Canopy Growth's recreational sales fell by 11%, Aurora's dropped by 3%, while Afria just reported a 23% increase in recreational sales from April to June. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud to say so far, Afria is leading in market share with the best brands in Canada. Thankfully, energy providers are shifting to renewables now that they have no choice and clean energy systems are becoming more cost efficient. But the US needs to move faster. And the most commonly overlooked source of renewable energy is known as biomass, renewable organic material from plants and animals, basically plant energy. Biomass absorbs and stores chemical energy from the sun within its matter through photosynthesis. We get and store energy from the food that we eat. Plants get it from sun rays. 
But why does no organization or government acknowledge hemp as the biomass crop? The National Energy Education Project lists corn, wood, and garbage. Is no one aware? Biomass is burned at extremely high temperatures without air and then converted to charcoal, liquid fuel, or gas through various processes for clean energy. A common method, pyrolysis, is the same process used to convert coal to energy, so we can literally just swap a dirty source for a clean one. According to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, biomass was the largest source of total annual U.S. energy consumption until the mid-1800s. What happened? Oil. And as of 2019, biomass made up 5% of total primary energy in the U.S., 46% from wood, 45% from biofuels, and 9% from traditional waste. But there's a huge disconnect. But where's hemp? There are many biomass sources, but we're missing out on the best renewable one. How and why do governments not know this? Are they oblivious? Or do they completely avoid acknowledging cannabis to ensure their cushy paychecks? Get this. In 1989, Jack Herer asked Steve Rawlings of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, if you had the choice, what would be the ideal way to stop or reverse the greenhouse effect? Rawlings of the USDA responded, stop cutting down trees and stop using fossil fuels. Herer then asked a brilliant leading question, insinuating hemp without saying the name, leading Rawlings to conclude, that would be ideal, but there's no such plant. Jack responded, what about hemp? Rawlings said, hemp? I never thought about that. Hemp could be the plant to do it. It's a wonderful idea, and I think it might work. But of course, you can't do it. Jack goes, you're kidding, why not? Rawlings responded, well, Mr. Herer, did you know that hemp is also marijuana? Well, you know it's illegal, don't you? You can't use it. To Jack's dismay, not even to save the world? Rawlings responded, not even to save the world. It's illegal, so you can't use it, period. Don't get me wrong, it's a great idea, but they'll never let you do it. Jack asked if Rawlings could pull some of the info for him from the USDA. Rawlings said, I'm an officer of the USDA. Someone's going to know why I want this information, and I'll be gone. That's big bureaucracy for you. No one wants to make any noise in fear of their own security within the structure, even if it would save the frigging planet. That is why voting once every four years isn't too much to ask, is it, America? Herer asked Dr. Gary Evans of the USDA in Science the exact same question, and Dr. Evans was responsible for creating policy to stop the global warming trend. His response, if you want to save the planet with hemp, you activists need to find a way to grow it without the narcotic top, and then you can use it. Hemp isn't the narcotic, though. There you have it. In America, conforming stupidity and job security comes before doing the right thing. To quote the great Charlie Munger, show me the incentive, I'll show you the outcome. 80 years of confusion and suppression nearly erased common knowledge that hemp grown for biomass can fuel a trillion dollar energy industry, while reducing pollution and helping redistribute wealth back to local communities. Thank God for the internet. This article in the 1938 issue of Popular Mechanics was the first in American history to associate any agricultural crop with the term billion. And sadly, it was the last bit of positive news published about hemp for a very long time. Well, until World War II when the US needed it. Then, after hemp helped the U.S. win the war, it was suppressed again. Good news, though, the hemp industry is coming back to life thanks to China. According to Brightfield Group in 2019, the U.S. is leading world hemp production with close to 300,000 acres. Not far behind is China with 250,000 acres, then Canada, Korea, and France follow. Seriously, if China didn't start, the U.S. likely wouldn't be so compelled to follow. Remember the 2018 Farm Bill from Episode 2 passed by Wizard Sleeve Neck Mitch? That change was likely made to stay ahead and compete with China in this space. The 2018 Farm Bill allows hemp cultivation plus the transfer of hemp-derived products across state lines for commercial purposes, allowing for sale, transport, and possession if produced consistently with the law and has lower than 0.3% THC. This is a big first step. But what it doesn't create is a completely free system in which individuals or businesses can freely grow hemp. Want to grow hemp on your property to sell back to the government? You can't. The bill ultimately creates confusion and tight regulations giving ultimate state-federal power over hemp cultivation and production. Blue states represent where cultivation is permitted, while the red states are still prohibited. So state departments of agriculture must consult the state governor and chief law enforcement to devise a plan, then submit it to the secretary of the USDA, who then has to approve the state's plan to eventually begin the process of growing hemp. So although the Farm Bill legalized hemp, you can't grow it without the right paperwork, applications, and connections, unlike us Canadians in the land of the free. How can you change this? The only real right you have in democracy. Vote Mitch out! 
On a positive note, the government expects hemp production to grow at an annual rate of 75% a year throughout 2023, cultivating 2.7 million acres by then, up from 300,000 in 2019. But here's the sad part, the complete disconnect and lack of understanding of hemp's true potential. Brightfield mentions the percentage of hemp planted will slowly decline because the industry will need to validate the value of the crop behind CBD production. Is the government allergic to evidence or just genuinely unaware that they're sitting on the best source of biomass energy on the planet? This is why you don't base the growth of hemp solely on CBD. CBD is literally one of the least exciting things about the hemp plant. It has over 50,000 different uses. The focus should really be growing as much hemp as possible for biomass conversion and clean energy to slow the pace of climate change. It got the nickname weed because it grows like one, anywhere with sun and water. The US government can encourage hemp farming domestically and then buy the crop from American farmers to fuel the country and export any extra. So many options when the plant is not prohibited. Instead of putting coal in the incinerator, you put hemp stalks. Simple as that. Plus, the necessary infrastructure and technology to process, store, and transport fuel already exists for dirty fossil fuels. Did you know Henry Ford made a car that ran on hemp ethanol? Constructed entirely from hemp plastic? Reportedly 10 times stronger than steel? That's the strongest natural fiber in the world at work. How did he pull this off? Well, he was Henry Ford, so he could afford to make it himself. Why didn't it catch on? Well, together, the oil, plastics, and paper industries had more sway than Ford did alone. Ford envisioned a future where plastics from hemp polymers were the building blocks of all products and fuel came from hemp biomass. With this vision, he made his organic car, and the proof of concept worked. However, the tax act struck first. After my research, I see this vision too. The hemp plant is harvested for its fiber, herd, and seeds, and those parts can be broken down further, made into biodegradable plastics, paper, concrete, also known as hempcrete. It's a thing, look it up. Metal, carpet, wood, insulation, all with hemp fiber. The plant is that good. I encourage you, Google what can hemp replace or how can hemp save the planet? It's no joke. And all that hemp can be grown domestically in the US, creating a whole new industry for American farmers to save on import costs and provide a lot of much needed jobs for rural communities. The paper industry, for example. If 80% of paper is imported when hemp can produce every grade of paper available, and government figures estimate that 10,000 acres of hemp can produce as much paper as 40,000 acres of woodland, you get the value of four for one if you switch to hemp, and you save a ton of forests in the process. The biggest obstacle in the past, besides ignorance, was the labor involved. Hence why slaves were used instead of paid workers, because hemp is so damn strong, reading it from stock to herd by hand was so tough, no one wanted to do it. Until the Schlichten decorticator was invented in 1917. It was patented, making hemp a viable paper source at less than half the cost of tree pulp paper. Plus it brought the processing time of hemp down from 250 man hours to just a few hours. Technology is wonderful if it's used for good. Hemp went in one end, fiber came out the other. But like Ford's hemp mobile, it went extinct in 1937. Good news today though, as the technology has been revived thanks to companies like Canadian Greenfield Technologies, with plants to fill the demand for specialized hemp processing facilities. You can expect more than decortication with the Hemp Train Decorticator System. Here's how the Hemp Train Decorticator System works. Unlike conventional hammer mill decorticators, which causes damage to bast fiber, attrition to herd, and cannot separate clean green fraction rich with CBD, Hemp Train employs innovative high speed kinematic action, critical in separating and refining hemp straw from baled field fiber to three high value streams with intact bast fiber clean spec sized herd and unique clean cbd rich fine green microfiber bast fiber for structural reinforcement clean spec sized high value herd nutritional green microfiber with naturally occurring cbd innovation and free market competition is a beautiful thing isn't it the decorticator technology has been simplified and improved, so now hemp can easily be converted to bast fiber, herd, and microfiber. But for biomass, you just need the stock of the plant. Another source had China as the top hemp producer, with the Federal Agricultural Service reporting China produces more than half the world's hemp supply. I can assure you the US does not like that, and that's likely why they've started on the hemp push that they have. As we've learned, power remains there by staying a step ahead of the competition. According to 2017 numbers, China is maximizing hemp much better than the US. The US only seems to produce it for CBD, while CBD only makes up 5% of China's use compared to 7% as a food source and 75% for fiber. 
This will be an advantage for China if the U.S. government doesn't overcome their ignorance and learn how to use the rest of the plant productively. Better news is that they're not alone, as the article highlights Romania, Colombia, Ecuador, Lithuania, and Germany aren't waiting to legalize hemp either. It's great to see them taking initiative and growing for reasons other than CBD. Hemp seeds are Romania's most traded product, while Colombia has roughly 50 hemp farms. Ecuador can legally export hemp and biomass helping local farmers and economies, while Lithuania produced double the hemp of Germany last year. There's so much potential with this plant, folks. And of all vegetable oils, hemp seed oil has the lowest saturated fats, bad fats, at 8% of total volume, and the highest in total essential fatty acids, good acids like omega, at 80% total oil volume. These essential fatty acids hemp seed oil is filled with are responsible for activating our immune cells. So why is the plant kingdom's richest seed still illegal to harvest yourself? To keep people sick? Hera thinks it may even be the cure for cancer and heart disease. Honestly, it would make sense why we haven't found a cure yet, because of a concerted effort not to find it. So to conclude, we've been made to believe that the switch to renewable energy looks like this alone. But the most practical switch would look a lot more like this, because hemp is the only annually renewable plant on Earth capable of quick regeneration while revitalizing the soil, sucking up CO2, and producing the greatest harvest per acre in the least amount of time. So if every country maximized their summer months to harvest as much hemp as possible, we can phase out fossil fuels completely by 2033 with hemp biomass at scale, and ensure all new clean energy systems are running with clean biomass reserves available. We need to shrink the gray and make the green line at the top a lot fatter. Where we find ourselves today took a long time to get to, so it will take time to modify. Americans, now 5% of the world population, use 25-40% to 40 of the world's energy. This cost to the global environment can't be measured, so the US must lead the countercharge sooner than later. If this series proves anything, prohibition doesn't work, and absolute power corrupts absolutely until tested or held accountable. Reiterating why change this November is so important to get America closer to its founding principles again and back on track sooner than later. Because losing any more freedom to further control cannabis is a death sentence for the earth. So it's time to get curious and take back the greatest plant on the planet. Come on, America! Don't let us all down now! Imagine where we'd be today if this great plant wasn't suppressed for 80 years? The role of cannabis hemp and other natural fibers should be determined by the market of supply and demand not the influence of prohibition laws, federal subsidies, and tariffs. So here's what you can do to help change the narrative and create a more sustainable future. First, vote for change. Second, share this information to educate others. And third, don't miss out on the long-term buy and hold opportunity to build wealth for your family and future generations. What do you think, everyone? Do you see the global potential for biomass? I even contacted the Henry Ford Foundation to get his old blueprints. Let's bring back the hemp mobile. I want to thank you so much for tuning into this episode, and I hope you found the series educational. If you did, I'd really appreciate if you could hit that like button for me. And make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any new videos of This Week in Cannabis coming out every Sunday. If you're curious to learn more about the industry and how to invest in it for the long term, don't hesitate to reach out, but also check out some of the other videos on my channel, on Instagram, and TikTok under Highly Invested. This is your host, Jordan Highly signing off. Stay highly invested in yourselves, everybody. Till next time.